of secure a brand new location. We're excited to say that the closing date of the sale of uh, Cliff Valley Way has been moved forward and we're nearing the shore of a closing date somewhere around February 22nd, February 19th, as we uh, <laughs> pull this journey of um, welcoming the possibilities then of us moving forward. We've signed the contracts on the new presidential parkway property and we know that with all of this coming together so quickly and so smoothly, we hope to be into that new property even earlier than what we anticipate. So we're claiming that goodness. We're so excited to say Second Helping, the program that has been providing all kinds of great food, fresh foods from uh, the grocery stores, has said thank you in a wonderful <coughs> banquet, applauding City of Light as it's one of its newest agencies receiving food and being part of a program that's bringing an end to hunger within the city of Atlanta. We're excited to share with you that the Institute for uh, Spiritual Growth and Emerson Theological Institute is training new leaders, and we're looking forward to even more students coming on board. We're going to be graduating three doctorate students this year, which we're really thrilled with. We're excited to welcome TV personality and uh, spiritual leader, Reverend Dr. Barbara King, to City of Light and her desire for her congregation to collaborate and work with us. We're very excited about that. Her congregation uh, hosts a wonderful ministry in Cascade, just south of 20, uh, down by the airport in the Parkway area. And they have an exciting ministry and they'd like to collaborate with us in the Emerson Theological Institute program, as well as some of the other things that we're doing uh, as the future unfolds. So it's exciting to think about what all's going on. So we ask today, turn to the person next to you and say, what's going on in your temple today? <laughs> now wait a minute, that may seem like a strange question. We're not really asking what's going on in your church. We're actually talking about the scripture today that's saying what's going on in your temple. What activities are going on in your temple? As we look to the scripture, it unfolds for us to say that this is not a physical place of worship. It's a real place of worship. And that's what we need. For worship takes place in the heart and the individual. Oh, there's a lot of things that can take place within this room. Great music, wonderful people, a wonderful ambiance to come together in, a great room. Oh, but it's more than that. Because what real worship is, is the individual and the role that you play. There are a lot of things that can go on in this room that we could actually, well, pay no attention to. Be distracted, removed from. You see, it's really what's going on in your heart and life where the quality of the experience of worship takes place. It's within your temple. You see, the temple in today's story played an important part, both in the Hebrew and the New Testament. It was the place where the Jewish people gathered, as well as early Christians, to come and learn and experience. But metaphysically, meaning looking beyond the physical, oh, as Jesus has taught us so many times, inviting us to constantly, don't pay attention to the physical, look deep within the spiritual, look beyond the great eyes of faith, look beyond to see the miraculous unfolding within you and all around you. Take no mind of those things that are physical of appearance, but look with the great eyes of faith. And so it is metaphysically we look to see that there is a temple within each and every one of us where services are being conducted. That's right. What's going on in your temple today? It's the temple of our consciousness. It's the temple of our awareness. It's the temple of our thoughts. What's going on right now in your temple? In your centeredness? What are you experiencing in this moment? Because this is where real worship is happening. Where the real connection is taking place. Where the real transformation is unfolding for us. And realizing that, we have to ask ourselves continually, what is going on in my worship? What am I worshiping? Are there thoughts that are going through my heart and life, and what are those thoughts that go in through my mind? What is it that I am really entertaining as I welcome in this experience? Are there thoughts that are destructive for our life that we hold on to? Or are there thoughts that are constructive that we embrace? Thinking about the temple that can draw our attention to the important changes that we need to make regarding our personal experience in worship. <laughs> We need to think about this. <coughs> what thoughts did I bring today? Where am I? 
in my consciousness. For the biblical story and events provide a lot of insights to our life. Every single Bible story is our life. To make it real and living, we put ourselves in the stories. <coughs> we look at the symbols and the message deep within every text that's so powerful us, for us. For these are not just historical facts or stories, but the symbols help us understand these beautiful ancient truths for our lives. Perhaps the most important event in the Hebrew Bible we look at is the Exodus. We find some beautiful symbolism for our day-to-day -day journey as well. That the deliverance of God of the Hebrew people from bondage to Egypt is our story. That we're called to be people who are leaving bondage. <laughs> things that hold us back. Things that confine us. Things that restrict us. Things that keep us from our achieving our highest and best. We're constantly called to leave our own e Egypts. To leave out the bondage and to walk in the liberation and freedom. This event became a spiritual experience. A rebirth that gave meaning and purpose to people's lives. And it's echoed over and over again as we talk about an exodus, an exodus. Well, the setting for the story today is Jesus is going to Passover. What's a Passover? It's a celebration of the acknowledgement of the exodus. They're celebrating this, and this is the context. Already in the mood is a celebration of being liberated from that which would hold us from being our very best. A celebration of acknowledgement that we've left behind bondage and we're now walking in liberation. That's the setting for the story as Jesus then comes to the temple. And as he gathers at the temple, we see there that us, there is something happening that is so powerful. His encounter with those who are sitting at the gate. Now, one of the things that we have to take note is that we see the lesson of Exodus is liberation is a story for ourselves. Because many of us would probably say that our lives really began at our physical birth, but hmm, let's think about that. Because it's really our spiritual birth or rebirth where our lives begin. Because let me tell you this, your real living happens when you wake up, when you wake up to your spiritual journey. That's where living begins in your life. Oh, we can go through the routine of life. Yes, you're breathing. Yes, you're moving. You're going through the day-to-day -day stuff. You go to work, you drive home, you eat, you go to sleep. Real living happens when we wake up. Wake up to are waking to, to this rebirth, this wonderful moment. When we wake up, wake, are waking up to our spiritual birth. When we grow physically, and life seems pretty much a ministry, mystery. We go through all sorts of experiences and wonder why a particular happen, thing happens in our life and why something may not happen. Well, it's not until we're really reborn, spiritual, awakened to this moment, that life seems to have some real meaning. It's then that we review our life in the light of our spiritual birth and we gain these wonderful new insights to the journey of living. Our spiritual birth, which is changed. Now we look at a world, it changes us, and we look at the world differently. It gives us a hope and a new future and a new way of seeing every experience. So as we look at this story of Jesus coming to the temple, we discover the spiritual journey that the text invites us to take. As Passover unfolds, he comes to the temple. And there at the gate, he finds people in bondage of all things, a celebration of liberty, liberation and freedom, only to find bondage. What kind of bondage? Ah, as they came to the temple, there were those at the gate saying, I'm sorry, I love the fact that you brought this beautiful lamb to offer as a sacrifice. It's not going to qualify. You need to buy my lamb for $19.95. I've got a set of two. You buy it right now, you'll also get this little special gift thrown in. That kind of approach. And everybody came with their own expectations and beliefs that what they brought was their very best, only to be told, no, sorry, not good enough, because you need to buy from me. You need to purchase. And suddenly at the gate was the bondage of greed and the desire to receive from one's own self. Suddenly at the gate was this sort of uh, pampering of the very flow of the goodness of just saying, wait a minute, I literally came to give up my best, and you're telling me now if I'm not welcomed? What's going on? Oh, and there were those who would say, better yet. It's better you don't even come and bring anything. Just come and buy from us at the temple gate. 
Because this is where we're making all of our money. We're making a living off of your spiritual life. We're really doing our very best to glean and to collect from you so that we might have something that is for our own gain at your great expense. And what Jesus saw was this great celebration of liberty, great celebration of freedom and liberation, was that the world was filled with a spiritual experience of bondage. You see, when we look at this, we say, what does that mean for our lives? Well, if we, as we find out, as we read in the passage of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 3.16, we're the temple. You were the temple. That's really what the Spirit has been talking about, the great symbolism of this story. You are the dwelling place of the divine. In your consciousness, this is the beautiful place where you encounter the Holy Spirit in presence. That's <laughs> at your gate of your consciousness. What's at the gate of your game? What's at the entry point there? Are there those who would try to sell you a bill of goods? And sometimes we feel like we can't really enter into worship because down through the years we've been sold a bill of goods and we bought it. Condemnation. Judgment. A spirituality that's filled with the sense of saying you're not good enough, you're not worthy. No matter what you brought, it's not good enough. You've got to find something better. Or a spirituality that somehow says that you're better off if you don't think at all. Maybe our thoughts would say, you know what, when it comes to things of God, it's better I just don't think. I'll just let someone else think for me. I'll let them do the thinking, and whatever they say, I'll just believe. And so I'll buy into that. But oh, that's not our liberation at all. Whenever we're told in some way that you are not good enough, you're not liberated. You're walking in bondage. And whenever you're told not to think, you're not liberated. You're walking in bondage. Well, your freedom is to acknowledge that who you are is amazing, powerful, and good. You've been created in the divine image of God, and you live that out, and you celebrate that truth. And you know that God has given you the wonderful ability to think for yourself and to accept responsibility for your own journey. And with that, you accept these kind of powers of liberation, and you begin to celebrate it. For in this story, we know, down through the ages, the ancient truths, the symbolisms of the Bible, that sheep, well, they kind of represent our thoughts. Metaphysically, beyond the physical, we look to the story, the depth of their sheep, reflecting our thoughts. You know that passage, all we like sheep have gone astray. Trust me, some of our thoughts have gone astray already this morning. Uh, so they were already thinking somewhere else. And oh, oh, oh wait, all we like sheep have gone astray. Wait, but we have pulled those thoughts back in. And how about the story of the 99? And Jesus leaving the 99, or the shepherd leaving the 99, going out to find the one that's gone astray. How true that is in our lives that sometimes there may be just one thought that's always wandering off, always pulling us away, that one thought of fear. That always pulls us away. We have to bring it back into the fold. Bring it back in to say, okay, wait a minute. I now can move 100% assured because my consciousness, my thinking is clear and not divided. You see, here's the beautiful analogy. Those who brought their thoughts, their ideas, are not told they're not good enough. Or maybe better yet, don't bring anything. And in this journey of our spiritual life, there is a wonderful freedom for us when we understand what's going on in our temple. Going on to say, wait a minute, I need to claim some things for myself. I need to know some things for myself. I need to welcome some things for myself. Truths that I hold on to. I need to learn them and hold, embrace them that empower me and lift me up that don't hold me back. Journey of spirituality and religion around us we find constantly. The Episcopal Church has just went through this wonderful movement of welcoming the LGBT community and opening their doors, only to find that their sisters in the movement of the Anglican Church have said, uh uh uh, we're now punishing you. You will not have a voice for the next three years because you welcomed in the spirit of inclusion. Wow. Wow. How sad it is to see this kind of movement coming across in the essence of spirituality. There's not a liberation, there's a bondage. And they're saying, wait a minute, you can't think outside of the box. 
You can't think in the loving context of welcoming others. No, you are not welcome to go into the temple because you didn't buy our sheep, our lamb. You didn't buy our thoughts or our thinking. And then we find those who would say in certain religions that a spiritual leader, a pope, a religious leader, a denominational head would say, and define for everyone, this is what is true, then no matter what you think, as a matter of fact, it's better that you don't think at all. Just accept what's handed down to you from those on high. And I want to tell you this. There's nothing about Jesus or his, his teaching that ever said this is, is what to think, but this is how to think. The whole spiritual movement of our lives is that of learning that how to think is the most important thing. How to think and giving us the guidelines, not what to think and just being told that you have no mind of your own. God is working within you in the temple and dwelling there and inviting you to embrace that. You see, this journey of injustice that Jesus was addressing was the bondage of the materialistic desires of those around at that time. There was at the gate of those who said, I am here to receive for myself and myself alone. Ooh, now that's a dangerous place to be. <laughs> it's in the realm of all spirituality. The divine flow is a flow, a cycle. It says, I receive, but not for myself. I receive for the sole purpose of blessing others. That in return, I know good and well, the blessing comes back to me. When we understand that cycle that no matter what you've received in the journey of your life, it's not for you to hoard, to hold, or to contain, but to disperse, to share, to bless others with your life. When we look at our lives and think about how we might live now from that context, this is a liberating message. Because when we do so, we are working to create a world that works for everyone, not just a few. We're creating an environment that says everyone's included, and we're conscious of that, as we want to share of the blessings that we receive. Far too often in our world, we think constantly, I got mine, you get your own. We think maybe in this world of consciousness it is across the United States that of a capitalistic society that says, you know, everybody earns their own, and you know what, if you didn't get yours, it's your own fault. Instead of the spirit of compassion that creates this world that works for everyone, not just a few, and how important that is. So what we have to ask ourselves is this question today, what are we buying? Too often, when we come to the world of spirituality, when we come and enter into the gates of the temple, when we really come into the depths of our hearts and our lives, well, what have we been buying? What are we bringing to this moment? Is it fear? Is it doubt? Is the world selling us some things for its own gain and not for our highest and best? Are we buying into the today's thinking of this world, which is, in the name of God, very selfish? Judgmental, homophobic, sexist, fear based. Jesus paused to cleanse the temple. Interestingly enough, we kind of think about Jesus. This is his anger moment. Woo, this is the one moment when Jesus gets really mad, right? And we have these pictures of him just being violent with a whip and turning over tables and chasing people out. Let's think about this a little differently. Jesus sees what's going on has to pause to create, to make a way of many chords. There's rich symbolism here, because although we focus on the violence, because that's our human nature, we want to see the story where Jesus gets mad. Let's see some guts here, you know? <laughs> but what we really miss on is the symbolism of the story that Jesus pauses to pull together those chords that would be used to drive out that which holds back, that which hinders, that which is a barrier to the very reason we come to worship, liberation, to experience it to its fullest. What's holding it back? Jesus wants to remove it. I ask you today, if we're really applying this story to us, what are you making your whip of, your cords? as you're pulling together to pause, that you might drive out those thoughts, those fears, those doubts, those questions, those things that are holding you back from your own personal liberation expression. What's holding you back? 
Are you ready to do something to drive those things out? And here it is that these are wonderful symbols of the spiritual aspects of tools that liberate us. Cords that we might pull together to create that which would drive out those kind of thoughts. One, denies. Two, affirmations. These are amazing spiritual tools where affirmations and denials are two movements of the mind. Yes, they move your thoughts. They move, they change your thinking by expressing the power to accept or reject. They truly lay hold of or they let go. I was thinking about that. There are lots of stuff that comes our way and we really embrace the spirit of denial. I am not letting it come in. In other words, we're really speaking in this way that says that anxiety, that confusion, that fear that the world wants to sell to me gets powerless, and I hang on to my good. I hold my good. I know my good. It is powerless. Because let me tell you this, the only way it has power is when you give it power. When fear is there in your life, the only way it has any manifestation is when you give it power. Or you can walk away and dismiss it. Because let me tell you, those things that you don't need, they're gone. They don't exist. They starve. So in our spiritual lives, we stop feeding fear. We stop feeding doubt. We stop feeding and bathing, nurturing, and coddling those things that create anxiety and confusion in our lives. It's an amazing change. So the denial says it has no place. It is not there. It is powerless. I deny that it has any place within me. The affirmation is that which really holds on and claims in our lives. Because as we do this, we say the divine love of God right now dissolves and dissipates any anxiousness, confusion, fearful thoughts. And I am at peace right now, even in the midst of my storm. You see, when we begin to deny, it has no power, it has no place. When we begin to affirm, this is what does have power and this is what has place. We transform our lives and our consciousness. And we enter into the presence of God in a mighty and powerful way. Ooh, the psalmist writes, enter into the gates of thanksgiving with thanksgiving and praise. Either one of those are fear-based, are they? Either one of those are doubt-filled. Either one of those attributes are things that are less than liberated.
them come with their dustpans and their Dutch cleanser and comments and their Lysol and oh, it was a clean day. It was preparation for the weekend in those days. It was cleansing the temple, you might say. And all those ladies came in and they would wax down the pews with pledge and they would dust the window ledges and they would clean and mop and sterilize and make everything just fabulous and clean. What for? For worship. Oh, some of these good old Polish Ukrainian women would say, well, you know, Pastor, everything's got to be clean and scrubbed. No dirt in God's house. Because cleanliness was next to godliness in their minds. There's was a sense of like everything's going to be free from anything that hinders the worship experience. Oh, we don't want anyone coming. We don't want Mrs. Jones coming with a white glove going across the window and just hmm, I see dust. We don't want anyone to be distracted from anything other than the divine purpose why we gather. Oh, and I loved how it smelled when they were finished. Oh, the place so clean and ready for worship. Maybe in our own life, we have to do a little temple cleanse. We're going to get the dustpan out, broom, the dust cloth has a little dust be removed. We have to do a little cleansing in our own thoughts and our lives to set us free that we might truly be ready for worship in the temple here. To really be able to encounter the divine presence of God in such liberation. We've turned over the money changers. We've removed those who are creating barriers. We've wiped out those things of fear and greed and doubt and all those things that can hold back the consciousness that says there is nothing but God's goodness to be experienced. And you see, that's really the place. For Jesus said, don't make my father's house. Where's the father? Within kingdom within. Where's the temple? Within. Don't make that a place of bargaining, deal-making, or trading. Now, some people have said, oh, they're so literal. They say, you know, that just means don't have a church bookstore, because we don't want any deal-making, trading, or selling to go on and <laughs> don't have any exchange. That's a total misinterpretation of this great spiritual truth. What it's all about is the deal-making we do within our own hearts and our lives. I know some of you, when the lottery was so good, you said, Lord, you know, you know if I win that ticket, I'll make this deal with you. If you help me win it, I will give you a portion. <laughs> I'm not so sure I ever heard anyone say I'll give it all. But here's the deal. You help me win, I'll do a little something nice for the church. I'll do something nice for God. We make deals. Oh, Lord, if you help me pass this test. At school, if you just help me get a good grade, yes, Lord, I'll serve you forever. Interesting how that works out. Oh, Lord, if you just bring that husband to me that I've been praying for and claiming for, and you know what he looks like, and you know exactly what I'm making deals with you, Lord. Because if you do, we'll serve the Lord together forever. We will not be gone on the holidays, on the good weather days. We'll not be picnicking. We'll... Oh, wait, oh. And when the Lord brought me that husband, so many forgot the deal they made, right? Because that's not what God's all about. It's not about the deal making. We're trying to trade things. Because if we're making the house of God this spiritual center of our life, a place where we borrow, we're not really walking in the fullness and in the liberation. Because what we're doing is holding back and dancing with that which is not our fullest and our best. 1 Corinthians 6, 15 through 17 says, Don't you realize that you are the temple? You are members of the anointed one, of the Christ. So, should I take members of the anointed one and unite them with a prostitute? Meaning, one who sells of their thoughts, their very essence, for gain, for personal gain, for things that are all about themselves. This illicit union should never take place. You don't understand that when your body, your temple, your thoughts are joined with the prostitute who sells for gain, you're selling your thoughts out for something physical in this world, and we've lost the understanding that we're really spiritual people, having a physical experience, not physical people, trying, trying, trying to have a spiritual experience. You see, the text goes on in that 
a beautiful passage. But when you are joined with the Lord, when your thoughts are one with God, you become one in the Spirit with God. Oh, how important that is. Oh, that we might awaken it, for this is Jesus' teaching from the beginning all the way to the end. Awaken that you are one with God, and all that is God is yours to claim, to embrace. Love, grace, mercy, the power, the strength you need, the forgiveness, it's all there. Don't let anyone tell you it's not there for you. Don't let anyone tell you you're not worthy of those things. Don't let anyone tell you that you can't receive those things because of who you are or how God made you. Oh, and don't let anyone tell you that you can't even think about those things or that you shouldn't. But what we find then is the disciples in the closing of this story, which unfolds so many nuances, they say to Jesus, Wow, I just remember how what you demonstrated for us. There's a beautiful passage in the Psalms that says, The zeal for thy house has consumed me and given me courage. They echoed an Old Testament beautiful passage of the Psalms. And what does that mean? It means that your excitement about your personal temple, Jesus, about your wonderful faith and relationship with God excites me to such a level that I have a to stand against those things. I have a newfound, wonderful zeal that comes within me by the example that you've shared and you've demonstrated because you drove out those things that could be barriers. I want to do that too. I want to do that too. You see, the passion for the temple, passion for our own spiritual lives, passion for our thoughts, is that which is so powerful, for it creates the true and honest and open dwelling place that God has given to us. How important it is, when you come to the temple, you ask yourself, what kind of services are going on? What's going on in your temple? Ask yourself every day, what's going on? What is going on in my head, in my thoughts, my consciousness? Because that's where I'm meeting with God. That's where it's happening within the very heart, the very essence of you. It's not what's going on in this room. It's not what's going on in the, with the singers or the music. It's not what's going on in the prayer. It's what's going on within you. Because trust me, you can have eloquent prayers and beautiful songs, bright music and wonderful sanctuaries. But if there's barriers in your thoughts, bitterness, hurt, judgments, Fears, doubts, questions, sense of unworthiness, and ideas that you're not welcomed. They're barriers at your temple gate. What's going on in your service? I hope you pick together those cords of denial and affirmation, and you destroy those things to set yourself free, that you might then have your own Passover, have your own celebration of liberation, have your own experience of God's grateful.